Um, next up, we have Una O'Brien. She's a lecturer at Queen Margaret University on international health and development, and she's an anthropologist currently working on gender, sexual health, and the prevention of female genital mutilation. Una's perspectives have emerged from a long-standing interest, experience, and commitment to rights, especially the women's movement, and the rights of people with HIV, both in the UK and internationally. I'd like to welcome Una to the stage with her talk, Seeing the World Differently Through a Gender Lens. Thank you very much. It's a bit of a hard act to follow, Jodie. I'm afraid I haven't got any magic tricks. But um, what I wanted to start with was to ask you what you think of when you hear the word gender. Do you think of ticking boxes and filling forms? Or maybe you think it's a word that's synonymous with women? Or maybe you think of militant, bra-burning feminists? Or possibly gender is a really big issue for you. It's been important for you because of something that's happened in your life or maybe the work that you do. But for many people, um, their eyes glaze over. We've heard a bit about eyes glazing over today, actually. But some people's eyes glaze over with the word. And certainly for some of the people that I teach, they have memories of um, short-term kind of training courses on gender that tell them what a raw deal women get and how it's all men's fault. And I want to switch you on to gender today and to challenge you to see that it's something that pervades our whole life and uh, is involved in the decisions we make and the life choices we have, how we live out our life in this world. So I'd like to start with a, a story, and the story is about myself graduating in the, quite a long time ago with a social science degree and getting a summer job, um, having you know, studied anthropology, got a summer job in the local children's hospital in the residential psychiatric unit. And in that unit, there was a little girl and on the notes, it said that that little girl had been born with XY chromosomes. She was genetically male, but she'd been born with no genitals. And so the decision had been made that she would be a girl. And she, her mother was a single parent. Their mother was never told this. And she had three or four sisters. There were no, male or, uh, no men in her family in the home. Um, but under the age of five, she was in that psychiatric unit with a number of problems and including the need for us, the staff there, to reinforce her female behaviour. And that for me was a really shocking experience, I'm sure it is for many of you hearing that. Um, but particularly because I'd been taught that gender's learned and gender's acquired and here was something obviously more complicated than that. And I think that experience for me set off a kind of lifelong interest in the issue and looking at the complexity and the way that gender determines our lives. So I'd like to move on and just ask you um, what you think gender is. So I don't know, I'm sure lots of you have done a bit of sociology here and there. Anyone like to tell me what they understand by the word gender? Any? Being male and female, yeah. Any other offers at all? Okay, we'll go with being male and female. So the ways that we're learned and we're taught to be men and women in our life. So gender refers to the social ways in which we're male and female. Um, and I've put up here some kind of stereotype pictures of gender issues. So um, the way that we learn to be gendered is usually through toys that we're given as children, through the clothes that we're given to wear, um, through constant reinforcement of our behaviour. So boys are told, be tough, don't cry, and here's a boy showing off his strength and a girl looking at him full of admiration. So girls are told to behave nicely, to not run around and make lots of noise. I know those things have changed now, but these are kind of stereotypical ways in which um, I think some of them resonate with us uh, growing up. And a lot of attention being paid to the way women look in the workplace um, and the strength that men bring to it. And there are people challenging those gender roles, obviously, in this very beloved poster. I think lots of people love this poster of women filling men's roles in the Second World War. So gender is about the social roles that we have. And to bring in another dimension of gender, I'd like you just to think for a moment about your grandparents. And if you all just think of some of you will have known your grandparents, they might still be alive. If you didn't know them, you'll have heard stories about them. Um, and I just want you to think about the, the way they acted, the clothes they wore, their daily activities that they had. Um, and think about that for a moment and think if that's different from the life you're living and the people of your generation live, whether they're male or female. So would you think that that's a different kind of life? Yeah, so I'm seeing a lot of nods. So I think that's a very common experience, whether you live in Latin America, in Asia, in Scotland, our grandparents' lives are very, very different from our lives. Um, and so gender can change, and that's a fundamental 
element of gender. And I like to think of that change as what I call a vertical change, so it happens across time, across history. There is another kind of change, and I think of that as the horizontal plane of gender change. And uh, I don't know where people in the room are from. I know Pablo is from Cuba, so I know that at least we've got one person here from outside Europe and Scotland. But if we look at different cultures, they have very different gender roles. Gender changes from one culture to another. So for myself, it was very shocking, for example, when I uh, first went to work in Nepal and I saw women on building sites, very small, thin women, carrying very heavy loads of bricks. And I think in Scotland and Britain, we assume women can't work on building sites because they're not strong enough. Um, in, in South Asia, dowry comes into a marriage with a woman. And in most of Southern Africa, men bring dowries, or bride wealth it's sometimes called, into a marriage. That difference causes a lot of argument between my students at Queen Margaret University when they both insist, no, dowries a man brings it. No, no, dowries a woman's. But they're completely different traditions there. Anthropologists have looked at lots of societies and their different gendered roles um, with some fascinating outcomes. And one that I have always enjoyed uh, reading about and learning about is hunting and gathering societies. Now, in the West, we tend to justify a lot of these kind of stereotypical roles by saying our ancestors were hunters, they went out to catch the meat, and they looked after the woman, and the woman stayed at home and looked after the children. But in fact, anthropologists who studied hunting and gathering societies, when they still li lived as traditional hunters and gatherers, there aren't really any of those societies left now. They found that the men did go and hunt, they did bring back the meat, but that contributed between 30 and 40% of the food that the society consumed. And about 70% of it was gathered by women, nuts and fruit and, and so on. And so the women made a very big contribution to the food of the society, and in fact were very valued for that. So the women weren't little women who stayed at home and looked after the children, but they were out there contributing to the livelihoods as well. There's lots more stories about hunters and gatherers and the kind of way that they live, which you know, throws a lot of light onto uh, our gendered world. So we have gendered roles. They can change over time. They can change over space. And we tend to think about gender in contrast or in opposition to biology. So the biology of men and women is obviously different. Um, men have XY chromosomes, women have XX chromosomes, and the main differences of our bodies are around reproduction. So women's bodies are, have vaginas and wombs and breasts so that they can have children. Men have penises so that they can uh, procreate, get women pregnant. And those bodies, those biological markers of sex differences, if you like, they don't seem to have changed. So if we find bodies from the past, we dig up Richard III in the car park or find a body in those, you know, peat men or whatever they are, um, we find those biological differences are the same. The bodies may be smaller, they may be shorter, but those biological differences haven't really changed. So we talk about this as biological or the sex versus gender or social differences between men and women, and these are much more fixed. What we do know is that these sex differences between men and women are the triggers, if you like, for these social gendered roles. And what we know as anthropologists is that every society that we know about, every society that's ever been studied, uses sex as an organizing principle in their society. So they use it as a way of organizing men and women into different roles, different um, relationships, different ways, different kinds of status. We don't know of any society that doesn't do that. And linked to those roles is a kind of expectation of sexual relationships that you'll have as well. So it's considered in most societies normal that a man will have a relationship with a woman, and vice versa. And we talk about that as heteronormativity, so the expectation that people will be in a heterosexual relationship. So having said that, it should be fairly clear that if people don't have a clear gender identity, life is pretty tricky no matter where you live. Um, so who doesn't have a clear gender identity? Well, First category would be would include the child that I talked about at the beginning, and we talk about those people as intersex, so people who are born without clear biological markers for one reason or another. There are people who feel quite uncomfortable in their body, so they would like to change from being a man to a woman or a woman to a man, and that can happen with varying degrees of success depending on the culture you live in, the society, um, the support you might get, and the money that's available. And then there are people that simply don't feel that they're ma male or female. They reject what we call binary gender identities, and the kind of term we would use is non-binary gender. Um, a writer called Fausto Sterling, who wrote in the, in the mid-90s, 
um, produced an article called The Five Sexes, and she argued that two sexes are not nearly enough to describe the variety of identities that we have in the world. She said that people, many people are not born completely male and, or completely female. Now, there are some societies that do recognize this, and um, here's some passports from different ones. The British one is in there, but you will, I'm sure, know that the British passport doesn't give the option of a third gender. But there is a campaign for Britain to do that, and that's where this picture's from. Um, I would say that going into this election, all the major political parties committed to re-examine the issue, although it has been examined a number of times. But what's interesting here is to see Pakistan, Nepal, and India in there, not countries you necessarily think of at the vanguard of gender rights, but all those countries have a community there called the Hijra community. Some of you, I'm sure, will have heard of the Hijra. And Hijra are not male and not female, so they live in a third-gendered world. Traditionally, they're considered to be castrated men, um, and they are men that, for some reason, don't fit the full royal male model. But there's all sorts of reasons why people might be Hijra or um, be taken into the Hijra community or join it. It um, apparently can include some women, women who might not have had children, and therefore they're not considered full women. So the Hijra... Um, dresses women and they are known for dancing and, and singing and they go to festivals where they can bring good luck um, and they're very prized for going to those festivals but if you don't invite them to a wedding or a baptism um, and you cross them they can also bring bad luck so they're seen also as a kind of quite feared malevolent force as well. The Hijra these days are struggling to make money in many parts of South Asia from these festivals and many have been forced into sex work as a kind of survival strategy. So unfortunately, there are high rates of HIV and other health problems with them. But I think the interesting thing here to see is that there are countries who offer this third option of male, female or other um, and, the, and the list of countries is, is growing. So I think the issue about gender then is to say, well, why does it matter? Um, what's the importance of gender. And what I would like to say is that, although there are many aspects, I think, of being male or female that we celebrate, I certainly um, love many things about being a woman, being gendered can also bring harm to us. And I think the last couple of stories I told you about when you don't have a clear ident gender identity give some idea of harm. But there are other ways in which it harms us as well. So for men... Um, Men die in much higher rates, for example, from accidents. Men are much more likely to be involved in alcohol and drugs and have problems from that. Men have many problems from their employment. So this is a picture of men in Sri Lanka coming back from very, very hard physical work in the fields, which really takes its toll on them, sometimes resulting in death. Men tend to work in very dangerous jobs. In a World Health Organization report that came out last year, um, men were, were found to have double the risk of drowning around the world than women do. And that's partly because young men and alcohol around water is often very dangerous, but also men work in marine industries such as shipping and fishing, and there's high rates of drowning there. Um, so, you know, men have a, a number of health problems associated with their gendered role as men. In an article that came out in the British Medical Journal in 2001, Someone called Kramer talked about the fragile male and the fact that men die more at every single age in life. They have shorter lives than we do, and dying more at every age includes in the womb, so more miscarriages will be male children. Being a woman, of course, we hear much more maybe about the harm that women experience, and um, I've said that gender is an organising principle all around the world. Again, as far as we know as anthropologists, every society has... Uh, men have more power than women, and women have less access to decision-making, usually less economic resources, and less choice about sexual partners and the life that they're going to live. There are arguments about some societies where women are very powerful, but we don't know of a society where women have power over men. So there is a kind of range there. Um, so the particular harm that many women experience is to do with reproduction and having children and the expectation that they'll have children, sometimes very young. So this is a picture of a society that practices early marriage. Early marriage is when a girl will be promised to somebody maybe at the age of two or three. It's illegal in most countries, um, but it's still practiced. And then once they men menstruate, they might go and live with their husband and be expected to have a child as soon as they can. And we know that pregnancy, when you're very young, is extremely dangerous to the body. Um, 
the, there are kind of things that interact with that. So in many societies, um, girls and women have more malnutrition, and this might be because boys are preferenced, and so they get the best food, or because uh, women eat last and eat after the rest of the family. Now, malnutrition um, in reproduction can also cause problems. So if girls are, are, have got very small bodies and they're stunted, and boys might be stunted as well, but this means that they don't reach their full potential of height and weight, when they're in childbirth, the labour can be very prolonged and that can lead to fistula, which is a gap between the vagina and the bladder or the vagina and the anus, which results in kind of urine and faeces leaking and results in the most terrible um, stigma for the woman. She's completely ostracised from the society and she is usually put in a hut out of the village um, and really abandoned and brought food occasionally. There are medical solutions to this, but this problem is in many poor countries and those women can't get access to that medical help. Um, if you suffer malnutrition, that's very linked to hemorrhaging in childbirth and hemorrhaging is the cause of death in about 50% of maternal deaths in countries like Nepal. So there's a lot of harm from being female and from those gendered issues and of course I could go on with many others, um, but the most harm I would say is not being born. So the World Development Report from 2000, uh, 2012 estimated there are 4 million missing girls and women in the world. Um, most of those aren't born or many of them are just not looked after. If they get ill, they're not well nourished and so they're not in this world. Um, the ones that are not born are when there is sex-selected terminations and that's an increasing problem in parts of the world. So the question really is why do we allow this harm to happen? If gender is so pervasive, why is it so harmful? And we don't really have answers to that question. But one that is sometimes put forward, this is a contested argument, but I just wanted to finish on it, is that... Um, in most of the world where there's private property, it's very important for men to pass on their property to somebody who's their own kin, usually to their son. And in order to do that, they have to prove that it's their son. And we can't prove fatherhood very easily. It's only recently we have DNA testing. But you can control women's sexuality, and that ensures that they don't have sex with anybody else. So the ways that we might control women's sexuality would be with clothes, covering them up, um, making them people can't see them. Uh, chaperoning them so they don't have free movement. We might also, uh, well, in European uh, history, women were given chastity belts when their husbands went off to war to ensure they didn't have sex with anybody else. But the most dramatic way really is through female genital mutilation, where in some countries the clitoris and parts of the genitals of the young girl are removed, and in the most extreme cases the vagina is sewn up in order to prevent any sexual desire or sexual activity. This happens in a band of countries across um, from West Africa to East Africa and parts of the Middle East. Um, but it does impact on other countries as people from those countries leave. And it is an issue in Scotland. So last year, the Refugee Council produced a report saying that over 23,000 people lived in Scotland that were from potentially FGM practicing countries. Now, it's not practiced uniformly in those countries, so the numbers aren't like that, but it's still a shocking number. And I've just put up here a picture of one of our students, Fatu Balde, who I'm very proud of. She's at the vanguard of fighting um, to uh, safeguard the children from these FGM practicing communities. And there she is with, maybe we should be saying Saint Nicola, Nicola Surgeon, uh, on Women's Day, as the uh, Scottish Government have promised to support these, these efforts. So I want to finish by just saying that I hope I've challenged you to see that gender is all pervading around the world. Um, it's part of our lives, and that you all are expert in your gendered roles. You've been brought up to be expert in it. You've learned how to switch them if need be, if you return to your grandparents' village. And it has the possibility of sometimes surprising us. So the last time I was surprised about gender, I got into an aeroplane, the pilot introduced themselves, and it was a woman. And I realized that hadn't been an experience I'd had previously, and I was quite surprised by it. So I hope you go out and look at the world through a gendered lens and be alert for those surprising moments. Thank you very much.